So I'm sitting with an electrical engineering PhD who has worked for a company uh, as well as worked as a professor. So you can clearly see the distinction between academia and working in industry. And essentially, I'm just gonna ask him a bunch of questions about electrical engineering and what his journey is like and what advice he has for electrical engineering students. So I just wanna give a brief introduction of who you are. Yeah, I was gonna say, Ali, my first thing to always introduce with is a name. But all um, I got was electrical engineering PhD. Yeah, that's that's all I care about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, give, give him your name. So I you I'm, I'm uh, Arjun Singh, or Dr. Arjun Singh, although no one calls me a doctor. Um, and Ali and I are actually really good friends, which is why we have this uh, kind of an informal setup going on yeah. right now. And Ali has me over here. Hopefully, we talk about something that's useful for you guys to listen to. So, fire away, Ali. What's going on? Yeah, so um, uh, let's just get right into it. Right. Uh, is electrical engineering a good field of study? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I'll say, forget it, even electrical engineering, all you have to do is wireless communications. Because <laughs> okay. that's, that's the only thing I know. You just skipped to question number seven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But aside from that, yes, I think electrical engineering is one of the best things you can do. Why? And more specifically, now that I'm a professor, it's also electrical and computer engineering. The two are so closely related to each other now that it's impossible to distinguish one from the other. So can you can you elaborate? Can yeah, you elaborate on that a bit more. And that's one of those things which is when you do electrical engineering only, you'll focus a lot more on power, you'll focus a lot more on comms, you'll focus a lot more on signals and communications, and you'll realize that you didn't really need to do all those things because at the end of the day, you'll work in only one particular field that you like. And so you can just get things you want to work in. Let's say you like power, you can just take technical electives in power and become a power systems engineer. Whereas you'll always have that lacking of computers, which is, okay, can you do assembly coding? Can you work with hardware? Can you debug interface, so on and so forth? And have you worked on projects which require you to work not just on the electronic side of the story, but also how electronics will be interfaced with yeah, but what what if a student like does not know? What if a student does not know which area they want to specialize in, and they're just kind of studying, like electrical engineering? Just like, what what advice? What, what about it? Like like I don't know. Would you say try to like specialize early on, find an area within electrical engineering that's interesting? Uh, so I hate this culture of hyper productivity these days. I think it's fine to not know where you're going, and have to take a little bit of a leap of faith. I think all mm -hmm. of us need to take that eventually. Um, I like to think I've started to figure things out more, but that's only, you know, when I have to present something or work with people behind closed doors, I have my own moments of doubt and crisis and then I get through it just one day at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think everybody goes through that. It's, yeah. Yeah. Like in the age of gurus, probably not as advertised, but. Oh yeah. I, I think instead of listening to what other people have done, you sometimes have to just listen to your heart and brain. Yeah, but, but it's good. It's it's definitely smart to get an idea of what you could do from other people. Yeah, of course. You should definitely... So yeah, the leap of faith is not just a blind leap of faith. Sure. You kind of look down and you see that, okay, there is a bit of haystack. So you won't land into you know hot concrete and kill yourself. Sure. So you definitely need that. And for that, of course, your teachers, your parents, your friends, your colleagues, your seniors... People who are watching you right now, you're a stranger to them, but now you're also, quote unquote, uh, an advisor to them. Well, I'm only sharing what I do. Right. And, I, and, and that's kind of I, the key I, thing. I, I make that disclaimer very clear. I share what has worked for me and what I think is a good idea. But obviously, you have to do your own critical thinking and you have to make your own decisions. And that's really what it comes down to. At the end of the day, engineering and electrical engineering are things which will, if you jump into them within a semester or two, you'll know if you're cut out for it or not. If you're not cut out for it, you didn't waste your time. You took you took some good classes. You probably met some good people. Hey, you, you don't like it, you don't like it. Go and do something else. The world is not ending for you. Well, like what what determines what? Well, like what do you can you elaborate on that? How do you know if you're cut out for it or not? I really think a big portion of it. People like to say it comes down to your courses and you know your grades and your maths and physics. I do disagree with that because one of my best friends spent seven years getting his engineering degree in which he spent four years clearing his maths and physics courses and oh, wow. uh, it took him a long time in that and then as soon as he got through those he just went through his degree now works in one of the biggest firms in new york city earning 150,000 a year right. so 
you can get the thing done. Um, I think a big thing that really determines it or not is if you're struggling with the initial maths and the physics, maybe you need to open a book on what you think you would like to do. Let's say it's mechanical engineering, you open a book on you know thermodynamics or motors or rotors, and you see if you can at least get the understanding going. You might not understand the equations and things like that, but if the concepts somehow are making sense to you and you think, look, I'm willing to go through my 40 days in the desert to get to that kind of oasis, sure. then, then you can put the work in and, you know, just, just buy it. So, so essentially it comes down to if you're interested or not. It comes down to if you're interested and if at the end of the day, some of those interests actually click in your mind, right? Because you could be very interested in something. Uh, I could be very interested in singing, but if I just don't have the voice for it, you kind of have to admit, okay, you don't have the voice for it and move on rather than just spend 50 yeah, hours But failing. it's very hard to make that kind of judgment because you're- it's, it's very hard, but you have to remember that one, people making this judgment have time. Two, in the process of making that judgment, you're also learning other things and moving on. You're still in a college. You can branch out and go to other courses. And one of the best things about colleges is that you can always go and talk to professors and let them know what's on your mind and things like that. And if you do enough of this, you almost always come to the right conclusion in the sense that I don't think anyone who spends enough time ever quits too early in the sense that people do quit early, but that's just because they think they look at one small factor and decide to make that the end all with all that. Oh, I couldn't do one really good exam, so let me quit engineering. And I don't think it should be like that. But if you take enough factors into account and they're all pointing towards letting this thing go, maybe you let it go. So, so you, you mentioned professors. Mm -hmm. What kind of questions should you ask professors if you're unsure about engineering? It shouldn't be questions and answers, right? That's, that's again, one of those things which is, I just need to ask him a question and I need to get an answer. It's more of having a dialogue. It's, it's about being able to put your thoughts forward, whether they're in the form of questions or in the form of a discussion or in the form of an altercation. That's all fine. But you should be able to so, get so your I, I, like views. I am I am a sophomore or a junior in electrical right. engineering. I'm trying to narrow down my field of focus, or I'm totally lost, or I still don't know what I'm trying to do. Like, who should I go to, and and what kind? What, like, what should be the initial? Like, okay, if I'm trying to start a dialogue, what's the opener to how to go about that kind of dialogue? Well, you just gave me the opener, right? Exactly what you said to me is what you would say to them, that, hey, I'm a sophomore junior. Maybe you know the person already, so you sure. tell them, look, I took these classes with you. And now what you just said, I'm lost. The follow-up to that, the first question I would say to, the first way I would respond to that is, what do you mean by saying you're lost? What does that mean? Like, I'm unsure what I want to do with my life. It's, it's a very broad, fuzzy... That's such a broad and fuzzy thing that it's impossible to explain. I... Okay, let's narrow that down a bit more. I'm not quite sure what I can do with my electrical engineering degree that could be fulfilling. I'm not even aware of the options. I'm not even aware of what that would look like. No, oh, okay. So in that, and it's funny because this is something that I can relate to right now. A student who's a sophomore actually came up to me and said, hey, what can I study beyond my regular courses so that I can get an internship? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. And, uh, and the first thing I asked him, was, okay, are you asking for an internship for next year? He said, yes. So right there, the first thing, just being proactive plays a big role, right? You come in first and you're proactive. Now, this is a good student. And when I say a good student, again, I still haven't even taken a test. So I don't have grades. The way I know it's a good student is because they show up to class regularly. They ask questions in class and they answer questions in class. Remember, it's not just, okay, can you ask questions? Can you always just poke the other person to learn from them, but also can you actually think on your own and answer questions? Yeah, no, that's... that's... And now he came in and uh, he asked me, well, I would love to do this. And I asked the student, what are you trying to do stuff in? And they said, and they said a very valid point. They said, look, I'm a sophomore. I've only taken two core classes. So I know a little bit of programming, a little bit of hardware language. Uh, and I'm not really sure. So I told him the same thing. I told him, look, let's, let's, let's forget what you know, but essentially you have any clue where you want to go. And they said to me, yeah, I think uh, working for a private defense contractor would be good. 
because they always have money. No, that's, that's right. You know, that's, that's a very simple thing. So, so you have to kind of be honest about what you want. If you want money or if you want fulfillment or if you want... Like, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, and, and actually, so let me put it this way. that There's always this concept that wanting money is shallow. Yeah. Or the fact that you're attracted to someone's physical aspects is shallow. Or the fact that wanting a flashy car is shallow. Or the fact that having a heated swimming pool is shallow. And I don't think so. I think as long as it's simple and it's honest and it's earned through a morally ethical and unambiguous way, there's nothing shallow about accepting that you are simple and your desires are simple and uh, you just care about getting rich. You don't really care how it comes. And if it involves work that you have to put in, you'll put the work in. If you happen to like the work, all the better. Yeah, but, but, but let's not, it, but, let's, but, not, let's, but, not it, let's not go on a little tangent first. Let's first answer that previous question, right? Sure. Which is, you've come in, now you're asking the question. So I asked them, okay, what are you trying to do? It said, I'd like to work for a private defense contractor. Then I told them, okay, great. Now you're looking for an internship. I can tell you 20 different private defense contractors from Google search. Let's not do that. Let me tell you the people, the places that I have personal contacts in. So then I told them about Moog. Student had never heard about Moog, suddenly loves Moog now. That's where he's trying to get an internship, and I'm going to help him. Uh, I told him Northrop Grumman because I knew that you worked there. I yeah, I've about there a few the times. MIT Lincoln Lab. Yeah. Again, because I know you worked there, and you can put in a word. Uh, sure. I told them about Lockheed well, I'll, Martin. I'll put a word only if he's good. <laughs> oh, real, very good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I told them about um, Lockheed Martin. So the whole yeah. point is... No, it's a little bit of a dialogue. But, but, you, that, but that student came with the self-awareness that, hey, I know what I want. I have accepted this. What no, I no, want. no, 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 no. That's the thing. That they didn't come in knowing, okay, this or that. There was a bit of prodding and poking and a bit of dialogue okay. that was involved to reveal all these things. Right now, I'm not going to engage into a 20-minute discussion exactly imitating word for word what was happening. There's, you know, there's, yeah. there's a bit of... Uh, subconscious and unconscious things that we do when we talk with yeah. each other that you can't really put in words but a big part of it just comes from conversation and if you go to a person that you trust and a person that you have some kind of a personal connection with that you know will take interest in you and is coming from a good place you'll probably leave with good advice so let, let's let's go back to talking about the idea of doing engineering for the money right I think it's a probably a very important uh, conversation to have and I think this is where you and I might have slight disagreements on. Yeah, we used to have big disagreements, but now I think you're coming more and more towards my dark side. I, I don't think so. No? Okay. I, I, so I, I, I come from a very idealistic, utopian uh, concept of if you do something for the money, like you won't be the best in the world at doing it. Because there's always an, because money is the motive, not the thing itself. Uh, so like, I think doing engineering for the money is fine if you want to pay the bills. But if you really want to be like absolutely fulfilled, you can't just do it for the money and you can't just chase money. And I, I, th I think it is quite shallow to be only like interested in money. And ironically, I think that people who try to do something great, they end up being very rich as a byproduct of wanting to do something great and not directly chasing the money. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on so, that type of perspective. Who do you think is the greatest electrical engineer in the world uh, ever? N Nikola Tesla? Uh, how did he die? Was he rich? Um, he had a, he could have been because he had a ton no, no, of no, 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 You didn't ask to answer the question. Was he rich? Um, I don't know. Probably he, not. He, very he rich. He died broke. Couldn't yeah, because anything. he spent a ton of money uh, fighting like uh, he, lawsuits and things like that. No, he died broke because he never made money. Sure, but there's like tons of other people like uh, Steve uh, Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. What did we just say? The greatest electrical engineer died broke. Sure. So, but one of the one of the other greatest electrical engineers, Steve Wozniak, mm -hmm. is a billionaire. Of course, because he did not engage in that ideal utopian world. With the no, I, no, I don't, being, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Nikola Tesla was in an ideal. He was just purely interested in the electromagnetic physics. Right, and but again, what I'm trying to say is that what you just said that if you do something great, you will always be rich is not a guarantee. No, it's not a direct not correlation. A but I'm saying it's funny enough how. It is usually a byproduct of, of doing course. something great. Of course, doing something great will always make you rich as long as you remember that you have to secure your riches. 
Sure. Right? But again, I think like... But I guess what you're saying is that if you're passionate about something, the likeliness of doing something great increases. I think it increases by many orders of magnitude. Fair enough. Because if you're only driven by the paycheck, you'll do the bare minimum to get the paycheck. Fair enough. You know? So I, 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 the reason I mentioned that is from a, like you have to, again, be honest with yourself. Like what gives you fulfillment? For me, it's, it's not about the money. It's never about the money. Even though money is very important and I always find ways to get it. Um, for me, it's never about the money. So when I look at the jobs that I'm applying for, obviously money is an important component where I, I make sure I, I get paid enough to not have money issues. But at the same time, I wouldn't automatically go for the higher paying job. Okay. I, I, I will go for the more fulfilling job. Right. But what was the question that you wanted to help them out with when you're talking about money? Like how much, like how should you think about what job to get? Like how, how much should you weigh the salary that you're getting versus the type of project you get to work on versus Look, the type of people? I, I think of it this way. If you have been blessed with intellect or hard work ethics, if you have passion about something that pays good money, great. Congratulations to you. You're probably one of those lucky people sure. who's gonna work really hard with a lot of fun, enjoy it, and make good money. Congratulations. If your passion is something that doesn't pay you money, and that is not highly likely to give you money in the sense, let's say it's the arts, uh, right? You, you might have a great love once again for singing, now, if you can do singing and prepare for singing while at the same time making sure that you can put food on the table, then that's great. Yeah, but don't you think you can create passions? Because no, I, 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 come, awesome. I come from an arts background. When I was in high school, I was interested in writing, filming. And that's what I was going to say. But I, I was practical in that I saw electrical engineering as a really good degree. Oh, so I, I found an angle within electrical engineering to be an artist. Yeah, there, there's definitely a fact that if you work at something long and hard enough, you might end up hating it, you might end up loving it, and you might not even realize that, okay, what originally started for money changed and became something else. For example, uh, I've worked both in industry and in professors. I was only more in uh, industry, but I love research, I love teaching, I love the challenges that come every single day. I love it when a student tells me that they changed their major from something else like mechanical engineering technology to electrical and computer engineering because of a talk I gave. I love it when a student tells me they decided to pursue their PhD because they saw my research subject uh, and they decided that they're interested in it. So there's a level of personal fulfillment that comes from this that I don't think money can buy. But again, because money is not an issue for me. So once you've solved your money problems and you've secured a high enough salary, uh, like making 200k versus 120k is no longer a deal breaker. Yeah, it's not a deal breaker. Because let's say it takes 100k to solve all your money issues exactly. and, and not worry about money. Right. So, okay, I like that. That's but, practical. Yeah. So, so, so the, 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 the more likely... So my point is yeah. from all this that when you decide, okay, I'll study electrical engineering, it's not, it shouldn't be only because, okay, I love electronics. Or yeah, I, of course. I, oh man, I have, I have a passion for electronics. No, that's stuff you have to say in your interviews and all that and then write in your essays, that's fine. Sure. If you just like the idea of being able to understand, if you're able to understand, you know, a little bit of electricity, a little bit of physics of electronics, maybe you've tinkered with electronics back in the day, you want to do something that you know is going to give you good money, Yeah. electrical engineering sits there uh, ready to work. You can work on something as massive as hydrodynamic uh, dams, which are you know billion dollar projects. You can work on something as small as a computer chip, again, billion dollar projects. There's enough breadth and enough uh, sure. width that you'll find something that you like. You'll find an works. angle within it right. that is fulfilling to right. you. Right, yeah. Even inside electronics, there's 500 things that you have to do from the mechanical side. You have to be able to work with people who are designing 500 other things. You have to work with civil people. So it's not only a world of electronics, electricity, and blah 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 there's sure. it's, it's a nice field of engineering which i think has plenty of room for growth will always keep growing is required unbelievably 
and we'll continue to be relying on digital. Yeah, I mean, our, we're we're living in an electronic world, right. little by little. Yep. Soon enough, even we might be in a fully virtual world, which is entirely operated by sensors, actuators, antennas. And now again, you're thinking again from a wireless engineering perspective, but yeah. just think. In the total field, you know, you will always need power systems, yeah, you will always need power plants. The need for energy is increasing. So whether you try to do it through nuclear energy or you try to use fossil fuels better. Yeah, or solar day, or wind. Or solar or wind, you're always working into creating something into electrical energy. Your cars are becoming more and more electrical in nature day by day. Tesla, electronics, batteries, semiconductors. Yeah. Uh, right, We have an entire Silicon Valley that's getting changed up. So there's an ever increasing demand for this field and it will always continue to be like that so that's personally why i chose electrical engineering i didn't have any passion for electronics i, I didn't have any passion for it either i i i mean i'm i i chose it because i say this in my earlier videos it was only four years and you could make like eighty thousand dollars a year and you could do whatever you want with your free time that's so it. that was my initial buy-in but then as i got more and more into it i'm like hold on a second this is actually fun it's yeah. actually intriguing and stimulating. Yeah. And actually, when I started reading books, my initial motive was I want to read a large number of books. So I was kind of tracking quantity, which is shallow initially. But then what that evolved into is an actual passion for reading, where now I don't really track how many books I read. I just read every day because it became fun. So I think this is actually a very important practical point you make, that starting out, the, the motive can be shallow, but there's a very good chance if you stick to it and find an angle that you like, it will evolve into a passion. So you don't just like find your passion, you kind of carve it out yep. along the way. Yep. And I think that's very important because nowadays there's a lot of emphasis on you have to find your passion, you have to follow your passion, but there's no like magical passion that you just wake up to, you create it along your journey. Create along the way. Yeah. Has that been, that's been the case for you, that's right? That's been the case for me. I think that's the case for a lot of people. I, I think so too. And. Uh, I think if you sit there with that determination, all right, dude, I don't really care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this off. Because yeah. again, remember, you're in high school. You've barely learned anything, and it's not an insult. It's a, you know, a, a reality, so to speak. Sure. So you're 18, and somehow you're supposed to figure out what you're gonna do for the rest of oh, your that's, life. That's nonsense. So that's insane. <laughs> but yeah, if you choose something which you know will at least make sure that you get good money, you probably won't want to kill yourself in 10 years from now. I agree. I think an electrical engineering or engineering in general. Although I, I say electrical engineering with all due respect to the civil engineers and, and, and the other mechanics based forms of engineers, I really think we live in a like electromagnetic world where we're where a lot more emphasis on technology, which is founded on electricity and electromagnetics. So I think there's a lot more room to play with electrical engineering than there is, let's say civil engineering, where you're restricted to like buildings or something like that. When you, when you say like electrical engineering is a field of engineering that just gives you way too many options and you can be creative in many ways. To be honest, I think at the end of the day, all engineering's come together to create big projects. Sure. Because, you know, you could argue that, okay, I want to work on microchips, but who, who created that clean room? Who's sure. taking care of the hydraulic vents that get rid of all the dust particles? Sure. Right? You couldn't do any of that without a civil engineer, without an HVAC engineer. Yeah, but, the, but these things were already figured out a long time ago. They're always being improved. There are improvements to be made. There are costs to be saved. Every dollar that you can save on your room is a dollar you can put in sure. your facilities. So engineering's come together, but yes, I again think that electrical engineering is the most superior one in the sense that just as, you know, I, I think some of the people who maybe do a little bit of exercise will agree, all body parts are important, but biceps are the most important. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, all wow. muscles are important, but at the end of the day, you need some nice biceps. You really think so? I feel like shoulders are more important. Yeah, for functionality, but I'm talking about aesthetics, right? I'm a shallow person. No, but I think, I think, I think even from aesthetic, shoulders give you the frame. Okay. You know? so, so, sure. Then for you, electrical engineering is the shoulders. For me, electrical engineering is the biceps. Sure. Whatever body part you think is the most important, <laughs> that's electrical engineering. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit also about your experience in industry versus academia. Uh -huh. So can you tell tell us a little bit about the first job you got at a, at industry, 
how that was, what you liked and didn't like about it, and then why you switched to being a you kind of touched upon being professor gives you a bit more fulfillment and helping students whatnot. But talk a little bit about your industry experience and, and how that went. So I I had all, always wanted to be a professor in the sense that in my final year of PhD, I stumbled upon a very interesting research topic that I realized had a lot of potential. I loved it. I could understand it, and I understood it better than almost anyone in the world does. And even today, that stands true. So I already knew I wanted to be a professor, and uh, I sent out a couple of applications. The wait period is very long for these things. So while I was waiting for that, I wasn't sure if I'd get it or not, and I was close to graduation. So of course I had to apply to industry. So I applied to industry, got a position, and uh, it was totally unrelated to what I worked on. The idea being that if you're a PhD, Anything can be thrown at you and you'll be able to solve it. That's the basis of a PhD. A PhD is not so much, I'm an expert on this. It's basically, no, I'm a guy that give me any problem and I'll figure out a way to solve it. I don't get uh, faced by challenges. I don't get intimidated by challenges. I don't get uh, tired from the struggle of not knowing what's happening, that I'll find a way. It's one something like that. That's a PhD staff, sure. by the way. Uh, and uh, okay. I just did not like the job at all because sure I could I could figure these things out but it was uh, something that was totally not related to me and also I'd come in the middle of a project ongoing so I wasn't building from the ground up in the sense I was in a little bit of a disconnect with my team but I was getting into the groove of things working but as soon as I got my professorship approved I asked to leave they were very nice they allowed me to leave and it all worked out okay so the duration was so short that I don't really think I'm qualified on explaining exactly what happens in an industry job. Uh, but like what, what would have happened, what would have kept you in the job? What was the, like if you were to isolate the money, nothing else in the job uh, drove me. There was no passion for the work. Because you didn't like the project? Yeah, I didn't like the project. And you didn't like the people? No, I, people are fantastic. The people that were fantastic? People are fantastic, dude. But like, what didn't you, can you elaborate? What didn't you like about the project? It was uh, completely unrelated to what I was doing. It was uh, a lot of coding that I don't care for. It was uh, not related to terahertz that I care for. Sure. And it was, uh, again, in the middle of a project trying to build up on something else, so. So you didn't have really much creativity or, or design? No. Uh, initiatives yep. you're you're just kind of laying the bricks that someone else already had planned out right sure and so okay so so you think it's important for a student and uh the other thing i didn't like is that you always have to do daily reports right you have to put daily reports oh, and uh like my, micro, micromanagement no not micromanagement you have just daily reports that you put in i guess yeah in a sense it could be called micromanagement yeah. but it wasn't so much okay what are you doing here it's more what did you do and you can't really say look There'll be days when you have absolutely zero progress to report, but what are you supposed to type, right? Oh, uh, so you have to kind of make something up. So you, so you just type saying that, okay, I worked on this and nothing happened, and you just feel like a fool typing that in. And it's, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'd like to do weekly what, progress. Why is that? is that? Is that because progress is not linear? Like you may have a few days of nothing, and then one day you come oh, up yeah, with a big idea? Progress is always sporadic. I think so. And like, like where? In research and engineering? In, in life. life. Really? Yeah. Huh. In all aspects of life. So 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 you have a breakthrough out of nowhere usually. It always there's always a breaking point. It's that doesn't mean that the work that you've done before is not useful. Well in fact the work led to the breaking point. Yeah, the work led to the breaking point, but that breaking point will always happen once. There'll always be a sudden jump. It's like when you try to break a stone, you might have to hit it a hundred times to get it done. All those nine nine hits were useful, but it's that hundredth one which suddenly broke the stone. And there's a binary, the stone was intact, and now it's not. Progress is like, you had nothing, and now you have something. Always works like okay. that, at least in my view. Yeah, no, that's very true. Now, speaking of progress, what kind of tools do you use, and what kind of uh, software do you use on your day-to-day -day life? Is it mainly MATLAB, or do you use any other type of... Uh... Okay, well, first, can you talk a little bit about your research projects, your research topic? and what, what you work on and the type of tools and software you will yeah, use. I guess, I, guess I can also relate that with the previous question, which was, okay, how was the uh, academic difference? Yeah, yeah, now we can show that. Yeah, now I love teaching. I think I have the ability to uh, take complicated topics and explain them in simple yet correct ways. 
a big part of that comes from all the work I've done to help you in your PhD. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've worked a lot together. Yeah. We've, we've, I think we have six papers together. Six publications. And, and we was, continue to work together. Yeah, and you were like two years ahead? Two years ahead. Yeah, you graduated what, a year and a half ago? Uh, a year ago. Okay, I'm graduating in like six to eight months. Yeah, so roughly two years ahead. Yeah, so probably a lot of you relaying information to me helped you clarify your, right. own, your own understanding. Right. I always think teaching, if the best way to learn something is you have to teach it. Yeah, you, you no, I agree. Like that. Uh, and uh, so the tools I use are, yes, of course, some simulation tools. MATLAB is something that's going to be essential, mostly because all my work is signal processing. And for signal processing, MATLAB is... You know the, the what, what what is signal processing? <laughs> well, for that first, you have to say what is a signal because we all know what processing is. You take something and you work with it. Sure. A signal is any kind of information that can be relayed in terms of time, in the sense that uh, a sensor is on at a given time and it's not on at a given time can be an indicator that you have an intruder. Sure. And now that sensor being on or off is a signal. Now, what usually happens is that... So some, some detection of some sort? A yeah. sig we just talked about what a signal is. But you have to detect the signal to know it's there in the first place. Now right? you're talking about detection, which is a different thing. Okay, Then sure. you have to talk about interpreting, that's a different thing. Decoding, sure. different thing. Jamming a signal is a different thing. But if you truly just say what is signal, I think it's just the representation of an information in a given time. Okay. I think to me that's some some, a some stimulus. Of yeah, some sort. exactly. It's it's a recording of a stimulus. Sure. That's a signal. So why is why is MATLAB good for signal processing? Because it's developed for that purpose, right? The the entire tool uh, is developed with the idea of signal processing. And another good thing is that, or I guess it's not a good thing, but it's whatever. Uh, I guess it's up to the person to figure out if it's good or bad. Is that MATLAB is made very akin to linear algebra. So you can then utilize powerful mathematical tools mm -hmm. to essentially work on engineering problems. And so then, you know, that's why your math is important, by the way, kids. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think it's a really good thing because most of, I mean, the real world happens in 3D and you can represent things in 3D vectors, right? Like for example, if you're modeling uh, the spreading of a electric field or something like that, or, or, the, or electromagnetic wave in space. Right. You could use vectors. You use vectors. You can take two signals and figure out to figure out how different they are from each other. You can even represent that in 3D space. So the amount of stuff you can do through mathematical tools sure. is insane. So linear algebra-based problem solving is probably like really good, yeah. right? Yep. Or like a really good skill. Yeah, not just like... linear algebra-based, but mathematical tools-based problem solving, right? That's why you learn the maths. It's, it's an arsenal that you're developing with which you attack engineering problems. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's a oh, that's that's a that's a great topic to talk about. Is many engineering students have the fear or complain that I am not very good at math. Should I still do engineering, or am I like done? So the problem is, very good at math are two very different things from your math course to your engineering perspective. And the problem is. You ask your math teacher why you're learning calculus, they can't tell you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a fact of life. They'll tell you, you'll use it later. Where will you use it in engineering? How? Oh, you learn it. Because they don't know. They know that it's used, but they don't know how it's used. And it's not because they're stupid, it's simply because they're not engineers, right? They're, they're math teachers. Uh, maybe they have a, a PhD in math if they're in colleges or really good schools, or they have uh, high school math teachers, maybe they did something else, decided to become a math teacher. Probably they're not engineers. They might be engineers, in which case they'll be able to help you. Yeah, but there's a very low likelihood. Very low likelihood. Now, regardless of what there are, maths is at the end of the day standardized. And by that, what ends up happening is that let's say you're trying to learn calculus. You have to figure out a differentiation rule to be able to do the integral of sec theta, tan theta. Yeah, like from, integration from, by parts. Yeah, from by parts or, yeah. you know, which one do you take, substitute, and which one you don't substitute. Yeah. Or there's a log in there, and I have to take the log sure. of that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bunch of tricks which comes more from repetition than from understanding in the sense that I was horrible at maths. How I became better at maths is by re repeatedly doing so many problems that I understood 
what a problem wanted uh, to solve it, what substitution rule I sure. had to use, what um, you know variables I had to throw in, so on and so forth, and I became better at maths. When you come to engineering, you're not going to sit and ever do differentiation by hand. That's just a fact of life, right? It's, it's not going to happen. You have to understand what that tool does for you. For example, now a big tool that we use in signal processing, and now I'm going to be talking specifically about you know signal processing because I'm an expert in that, is Fourier transforms. Mm -hmm. In MATLAB, you don't sit and do an integration, blah, blah, blah. You type FFT, which is do a Fourier transform of this thing. Mm -hmm. That FFT does a bunch of nonsense, which is all integration. Now, if you go and look at what Fourier transform is, you'll see an integration sign, which continues till infinity. Then it gets changed into a summation sign, has crazy numbers and variables. And you just have to know all Fourier transforms is saying is every signal can be broken down into a very simple basis thing. Like every single song can be broken down into a combination of your basic chords. Right? You only have yeah. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And, and what are these chords? These are just frequencies, right? Right. And these are just frequencies. Now, in Fourier transforms, you only have two chords. It's like saying there's an A and B, sine and cosine. You just combine them at different frequencies, different pitches, and you create any song you like, same way you can create any signal you like. Those integrations shouldn't scare you and you should understand, okay, this means an integration, so I have to combine all of these together. And if at some point I need to figure out what's going on, this is that thing. After that, you never use that integrator again, you just type it and call it FFT and work. That's what mathematics is to an engineer in the sense you have to understand implicitly what your programmer is doing so that you can tell it what to do and what things you need to utilize, but you're never gonna sit by hand and work on you know, differentiating sec theta, tan theta, and then integrating something, something. Sure. So again, if you're bad at maths, do more maths, that's how you get better, right? But you shouldn't forget about engineering because you can't do maths. If you're good at maths, you'll probably be very good at engineering for the simple reason that you already have that kind of a mindset that's gonna come in handy and so on and so forth, and you're probably a smart guy, right? Because who is good at math? You're probably well, smart I, people. I would argue most engineering graduates are like mediocre at best at math. Right. And that's totally okay. Uh, yeah, I think to get better at maths, you just need hard work ethic. Yeah, and practice. And practice. The more yeah. you practice, the better you get at math. Yeah. By the way. Uh, so yeah, I don't think you have to quit engineering yeah. for that. And, and okay, so let's talk a bit like, like math, math is usually associated with genius. Do you think that is always the case or not? Yes, the case? absolutely. I think both maths, physics, and chemistry are realms of geniuses in the sense Newton was a genius. He gave us integration, and after that, we common people can apply it to solve problems. Sure. Um, Fourier was a genius, gave us Fourier transforms, and now we can utilize it to solve problems. Euler was a genius gave us Euler's identities and sure. Euler's uh, equations, and now we can utilize it to solve problems. Um, what, what else? Uh, Faraday was a genius, gave us electromagnetics, and we can solve yeah. these things. Although, so, although Faraday only of was course, I understand trigonometry. Right. That's still, but my realm is that physicists, mathematicians, and chemistry, these are people who create tools fundamentally that then engineers can pick up and right. apply. But, but like being an expert mathematician is not a prerequisite for genius. Would you agree with that? Uh, sorry, I think you meant the other way, that being a genius is not a prerequisite for being an expert mathematician. No, 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 like, like you can be a genius and be okay at math. Like you don't oh. need to be... Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yes. for example, Albert Einstein, Yes, was course, as best, like again, said, mediocre at yeah, math. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, Michael Faraday. To be a truly great contemporary in maths, you need to be a genius. But to be a genius, you need you don't need to be truly great at maths. Yes, I, yes. Think, I think that's very important for yes. students to understand because yes. I get many comments where people are like, oh, I'm not very good at math. I'm probably not going to be a good engineer. And I think that's not the case at all because if that's the way Einstein or Michael Faraday or anybody who is not like a Euler at math thought we wouldn't have any of these other great contributions that are outside of mathematical realm. But the other side of the coin is that being good at math helps a ton. Like, let's be real. 
when if you're really good at math, you probably cruise through a lot of the engineering exercises in class, right? Look, let's put it this way: that there's Lady Luck is the prettiest lady around, in the sense that everyone wants to be with her, and if she's by your corner, you're gonna go places. Sure. But she has this ugly sister called Hard Work, who be with you, and who's much, much, much more faithful. Yeah. And if you can get Hard Work in your corner, she might not look pretty. But she'll be the woman of your dreams. In the sense, if you're not good at something, there is an X amount of work that you have to put in to become good at it. That X amount of work will change based on how much nature has blessed you with gifts mm -hmm. of intellect, of uh, understanding, of conceptualization. And that holds true not just in like engineering, it's any in way. all aspects of life. There are people who have the ability to eat horrible food and not put on fat. There sure. are people who almost eat nothing and just cannot get rid of their fat because sure. of metabolism. There are people who are six feet five inches tall and will dominate in basketball just because of their height. Sure. There's also Isaiah Thomas who's five feet seven and can still dunk because he's worked that way. That's very true. Uh, you know, there are women engineers who constantly prove that there is no bias of the male mindset towards engineering mm -hmm. and they might have to put in extra effort to shatter those kind of uh, perspective barriers and things like that right. so there are obstacles that both nature as well as society put forth and there's an x amount of hard work that you will put in to get to the other side what's your motivation for that hard work if it's money great if it's passion great if it's something else great okay i really like that now do you do you think do you think you kind of should be aware of your like like ma many 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 students know what needs to be done right like I know I have to do this homework assignment and I know that studying with this test for this test is probably a good thing but I just can't get myself to do it oh procrastination yeah suffer from it myself don't have a solution for it sure I'm 27 I'm still learning why why do we procrastinate do you think it's because the the soul is rebelling against the work I don't know. Um, that's something I think uh, about a let's, lot. Let's put it this way: I, I should I should search and find out why people procrastinate. But I've been procrastinating on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think everybody procrastinates. I think it's part of. Uh, I'm sure nature. one day we'll figure out why you procrastinated, right? And one day everything will make sense. I I think I think there's like I've I've developed some interesting theories along the, the way, but I think in in engineering especially. Very often, the reason to procrastinate on an assignment or to just not want to study for the exam is like deep down you might be dissatisfied with how something is structured and it doesn't perfectly suit the way you want things, and you just rebel against that. Yeah, I, I think I think you're trying to find causes for whatever reason. Is no, I mean think about it because people like from a very practical perspective, everybody pr procrastinates, and and students procrastinate a ton and engineering students probably procrastinate the most because the type of problems you have to solve are difficult and you probably don't see like the end result being immediate or anything like that so there's probably an element of like i don't see how doing this homework assignment is going to change my life don't, don't Dude, you think like how do you overcome uh, these kind of i think tendencies? procrastination is not specific to the fact that it's an engineering problem i procrastinated from sending emails, I procrastinate from putting my laundry in, sure. I procrastinate from exercising, I procrastinate from, by the way, I've been procrastinating from putting uh, coins in the parking meter, so we probably need to hurry on that. Shit, we do. We should. All right. Uh, All right we probably have to wrap this up so his so, car doesn't get yeah, towed. Final note, I don't think procrastination is specific to engineering. I think it's... A no, I don't, I don't think it's specific to engineering, but I'm saying it's more present in engineering because the difficulty of the problems you have to solve increase. Maybe. Um, I Like... I, oh, okay, I see what you mean. That in engineering, you will definitely procrastinate because more because yeah, it's, it's just a daunting because it's task. hard, right? And, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Have, Okay, fair enough. Like I think, I think, I think. Yeah, my, the more my, daunting a task, the more likely yeah. you procrastinate. And engineering, the tasks will be daunting. Also, you'll have less clarity on how to do it, why you're doing it. It's it's like more fuzzy. For example, if you're like you, you do your laundry because let's say tomorrow you have an interview and you don't have any clean clothes. The motive is clear, so you're less likely to procrastinate. And there's a deadline, and you're like, okay, I'll just go get this thing done. But I think when you're presented with an engineering homework problem, you don't even know, one, why you're solving this. And, and two, you're like, 
okay, how do I even go about this? Like these equations I haven't seen before. So I think the more fuzzy the problem is, the more you're likely to procrastinate. So my method for overcoming procrastination is get like as much clarity as possible on why I'm solving this and how to go about it. Okay. Because I think once you do that, you eliminate the fuzziness and then you have a very clear first step to take. I haven't been able to eliminate procrastination. Okay, I think a very good first step to take is we go and put money put in the money parking, meter. parking meter. All right guys, this is pretty much everything from my good friend Arjun. So again, we published a bunch of papers together. Uh, we made uh, we made our mark on we the field of- We we'll uh, continue to make our mark. Yeah, terahertz antennas right. and in space and terahertz space communication. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure uh, working and talking with this guy. So yeah, um, if you have any questions for him, I'm gonna put his email and his credentials down in the description, as well as you could use the comments. I'm trying to, con I'm convincing him to start his own YouTube channel, uh, but he's not- Procrastinating on he that. He's procrastinating on that, yeah. <laughs> Bye, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace, love. Okay, guys.